Hey, Raymond. Howdy. How are you today? I'm all right. It's all a beautiful right. day here in Colorado. Nice. What part of Colorado are you in? City, city called Longmont. Okay. It's about 45 miles uh, north of, of Denver. Okay. Mm-hmm. Cool. And I'll you're be in spending a bunch of time. Uh, well, I have property there and um, the framework for a community there, but I am currently in Missouri building community, and I'll be heading to Boulder and been be spending some time there. Oh, cool. Pretty heavily for the next few months. Longmont is just 12 miles from Boulder. All right. Yeah. I'm, cool. I'm there all the time. So. Right on. Hey, John. Hello. Hi, John. Hi, John. Raymond. Raymond. Raymond, John. Nice to meet you. Yeah, you too. I think we'll have a few other people joining us, so we can just hang for a little bit. Yeah. That's just... That's Jeffrey. Hi. Hi, Jeffrey. Hey, Jeffrey. Where are you gentlemen located, John and Jeffrey? I'm in uh, Quebec City in Canada. I'm in Manhattan. It's very hot here today. Oh, wow. Here, too. Yeah, it's a heat wave. Mm. In Missouri. You're in Missouri? Yeah, it's hot here, too. Well, we just got a storm blow through, which cooled it off. That's nice. But just keeps it humid as ever, which you're no stranger to in Manhattan. Yeah, I looked at the humidity this morning. It was 96%, but it wasn't (laughs) raining. <laughs> I, I've already changed my shirt three times today. <laughs> yeah, oh my goodness. And, I, and I just took a cold shower and I'm still sweating. It's terrible. One of these days I'm going to find out what that actually means because obviously if the air is not 96% water. It means, what well, does it? well, we have a physicist here who might be, <laughs> might be able to explain. <laughs> At the quantum level, though. Explain it at the quantum level. <laughs> oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Doug. Hello. Hey, Doug. Is it, is it Hello, hot Ray. in Kentucky? I'm actually physically sweating very, very profuse, profusely right now. I was going to sit outside, but uh, I took a jog to, to get to my, my Wi-Fi spot, so... <laughs> Pardon the dripping, if you notice. I feel like the odd man out. It's completely beautiful. It's like perfect. It's paradisical uh, here <laughs> here in Colorado. I literally, I went for a, I walked my dog this morning, and I was reflecting on how utterly perfect uh, the weather was. There wasn't a cloud in the sky. It's a kind of cool breeze. It's sunny. Everything's in, in bloom. Everything is green. Uh, but it's not always that way. One of the things they say in Colorado is. You want the weather to, to change, wait 10 minutes. And uh, that certainly can be true. Hmm. Well, uh, relative, that's coming that way. Relative humidity is the ratio of the current hu- absolute humidity to the highest possible absolute humidity. humidity. So that's why it's, it, it's just a ratio. Okay. <laughs> So if it hit a hundred percent, then it will rain. It, it you will be it, right. So. That means. <laughs> well, that would be the saturation point, right? The the humidity saturation point. But if the air is warmer, it could hold more moisture, yeah. which is why warmer, um, you know, weather uh, can be much more um, severe. Uh, at least I don't know, that that's my rudimentary understanding of the <laughs> meteor, meteor, meteorology. Um, so it's, uh, Caroline said she was going to join us, but she might be late or, um, you know, what I'm just thinking is we used to start at one and we switched to starting to, uh, at noon. So that might be, um, uh, 
an issue. But um, I, I had a kind of loose framework in mind for how we could conduct, conduct this talk uh, because we're kind of meeting um, different contexts. And uh, the, four of the, the four of us, myself, John, Jeffrey, and Doug, have had num numerous conversations by this point. Uh, and Caroline joins us. She and I have also had many conversations. And they've, they've spanned a, a range of, of topics and subjects. And some of it has been philosophical and cosmological. Some has been about science and technology. Some has been about society and culture. Um, and some has been about kind of meta, what we're doing in this, this kind of this cultural space that we've been developing uh, called Cosmos. And part of what, uh, I mean, part of what I think is the, the overlapping interest uh, between Cosmos and what you're doing, Raymond, uh, with CoGov and with Holochain is that we have this aspiration towards or in intention to participate in a, a larger emergent happening on many scales, uh, from local scales of how human beings interact and interrelate with each other in, s in small groups to planetary scales, like what kind of a civilization are we moving towards? What kind of uh, a world do we want to contribute to and co-create? And so um, I thought that we could start with, uh, 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 with a few, just a little context for how we met uh, and that you know, I could lay that out very briefly, but then I'd like to say a little bit about, about Cosmos and lay that out for um, anyone who would be watching this or listening to it later. And then turn the attention to you, Raymond, and CoGov and learn more about your vision and what you're working on and try to get as clear a picture of that or at least, at least a, as sufficiently clear a picture of that as we can so that in the latter part of the dialogue, we can move into you know, more uh, open questions and more constructive um, interaction around that, the interface of you know, where does CoGov and its vision uh, intersect with Cosmos and, and its vision, both of which I think are emerging. Like they're not final you know, things at this point. So it's a creative process that we're undertaking even right here in this conversation, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that sounds great to me. Cool. Um, all right, so we're going to go f officially for 90 minutes, so until uh, 1.30 Mountain Time or 3.30 Eastern. And then if anyone, anyone wants to hang on uh, afterwards and continue, uh, we can leave the line open for, for that. But Raymond, uh, you and I met at the Holochain Hackathon in Denver a few weeks ago. And we just talked for uh, maybe 30 minutes or so, and I got the gist of what you were doing. Um, perhaps you got a bit of the gist of what, what I was up to. And you shared a paper um, with me, uh, a link to a, a, a document called the uh, Digital Co-Governance Web Doc, uh, co which is accessible at cogov.tech. And so I shared that with, in our forum, uh, infinite conversations and suggested that, you know, based on the conversation we had had, we could follow up and read this and study it and then invite you on to talk about it so that we could, you know, deepen our understanding and see where the, um, where the overlap is and where the potential like applications are for, for, for what this is. So, um, but, uh, I, I, so We'll get into what Holochain is. Uh, we've talked a bit about it amongst ourselves, and we've done a couple of other sessions just for, for context on um, distributed, decentralized kind of technologies. Like uh, we did a, a Cosmos Cafe, a, a discussion like this on democracy.earth. And then we, we did another talk more on the technology side, looking at screen, you know, screen culture and larger systems of media and politics and how technology and economics kind of 
uh, collude to um, play out certain p- pattern dynamics and power dynamics on, on you know, large and intimate scales. So we've kind of had philosophical conversations. We've looked at you know, multiple aspects of this. Um, but I think the, the, I mean, the, the core question that I keep coming back to is, okay, so what do we do? How do we respond to that? What's our, what's our response to this situation that we're all collectively in and we're also individually um, dealing with in our own particular ways? And so well, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll save this for later, but th- one of the things, just to, to, just to put a flag on it, that attracts me about Holochain is this distributed um, architecture and also what they call a user or an agent-centric uh, architecture. Uh, and there are reasons for that, I think, at the you know, computer level, computer science level, but the social implications for, of it are what are particularly interesting. And where I think that um, there could be this uh, overlap with Cosmos. So I would like to kind of kick this off to read a, a summary that I wrote over the weekend of a kind of ideal vision of what I think Cosmos is or could be. And it's going to be, you know, again, with the user, the agent centric, this is my version of it. This is something that I'm articulating doing my best job to capture various themes and concepts that we've discussed in, in our groups. Um, but I don't want to um, say that I capture them completely or fully or, or, you know, this would be a starting point for a discussion, just so you know, like the status of this particular articulation. But for me, it's, it's the most current kind of complete um, uh, version that I could come up with. Uh, and so this will be new to Jeffrey and John and Doug. Um, but, and again, it's ideal and it's, it's not like an, an, an elevator pitch either. Uh, it's, it's something that you could read like on one page and get like a gist of, okay, what are these people up to? Um, so I have a train going by, it's just but I'll, I'll go on. Um, actually, I think I'm going to have to wait for this train. <laughs> I live about a, mile, a, a block from tracks that go right through our neighborhood. Uh, so Longmont was a um, you know, frontier city. It was actually created by a group of investors from Chicago. They bought a square mile of land and uh, oh, nice. set up a couple of neighborhoods. And there was you know, uh, agriculture, mining, and so forth around here. But just a half a mile from the railroad tracks. <laughs> yeah. I'm on the other side of the tracks, uh, I think. <laughs> I might have missed it earlier, but um, where are you located right now, Raymond? I'm in Ava, Missouri, building okay. community here. Gotcha. And I'll be, heading, I'll be heading to base largely out of Boulder here in a few more weeks. So. Wow. <laughs> be right cool. next to Marco. All right, so the train's gone. Um, All right, so again, this is an ideal kind of statement, but there's a lot of actuality. Like we've been working on this now for uh, three, at least three years. Uh, And yeah, and and I guess part of it, I think one last thing I want to say is that we're working on this, but we're also like, I think, on the verge of moving to some other level, right? Of what, what happens next? So there's a bit of that in here as well. Uh, Cosmos is a community platform and media company cooperatively owned by its members and creative agents. Its mission is to catalyze collective genius and propagate planetary culture in service of birthing an ecological civilization. Working through literature and the arts, technology and science, spirituality and activism, Cosmos provides a constellation of emergent systems and ethical designs 
for learning, collaboration, and exchange among peers. It's an experimental microcosm, a dynamic field of relationships in which we may re reimagine ourselves in the whole. On a practical level, Cosmos offers its members a virtual space where they can develop, produce, and market or gift their work uh, to the world. As well, it lets them discover, sponsor, and respond to the work of others. Uh, I'm working on the language for this. I want to add something parenthetically about sparks of genius and, and so forth. But uh, members participate in deep conversations, experience creative fellowship, and contribute to shaping the larger vision and project. Uh, this, uh, these activities are currently take place through our websites, infiniteconversations.com, metapsychosis.com, uh, and then Theory of Everybody, which is in development. That's, uh, however, future versions of Cosmos could sponsor local in-person events and have physical locations or access to venues through a, a network for community gatherings, creative intensives, contemplative retreats, and integral, edu integral education. Uh, an internal currency, uh, which we call Litcoin, lit uh, and distributed governance structure are being conceived to harness and channel the collective intelligence of our living systems in the most beneficial ways we can imagine. At this time, activity on the platform centers on reading and writing, reading and writing groups, uh, online dialogues uh, like this one, uh, media production, like podcasts and videos, and literary publishing. Uh, we are also working on the design and evolution of Cosmos itself. Our long-term vision is to produce world-changing art that inspires countless people to join the cosmic adventure. And uh, so I'd like to ask you, Raymond, like I mean, part, part of you know, what we'll need is a way to, a way to bring, that, bring this con collective intelligence you know, into into reality, into real life, to actually make it work in the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm really wondering how CoGov uh, might be able to help with that. And, you know, also what your role is in, in the CoGov project and you know, what your vision is for, for what it could be. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for that introduction. I'm really uh, honored that you invited me to be here and share and meet all you guys. And, um, yeah, and, and sort of reiterating what uh, the vision of Cosmos is, which, you know, we got to talk a bit about in Denver, and that is definitely exciting. And I very much see where, yeah, where, where there, there's this layover and connection, and I'll elaborate on. Um, so Cosmos will certainly have, it sounds to me, like some um, software tools to help implement some of this stuff. Um, that you're describing and and in that um, and in the fact that it is software user accessible software that has a user interface and has a mean of, of that ac user access it is something that CoGov is not because CoGov does not um, on its own present a user interface it is not an application it is not a specific prescription of how governance should happen what it is, it's a framework by which multiple modes of user interface and governance and even um, currency exchange and value flow exchange can happen in a way that is standardized and transparent. So um, in other words, the specific ways of, of, of governance that you decide on for your for your cosmos cosmology <laughs> um, would be able to be um, implemented and standardized down into, uh, into it with code of in such a way that any other organization embarking on this kind of um, mission of collective intelligence coordinated at scale, right? Um, through multiple membranes of, of different councils, probably something along those lines of people are contributing, um, have the ability to interact with each other in a really 
simplified way. Um, just like, <clears throat> like currently, you know, things are pretty standardized in a lot of ways in terms of doing business in the world. Um, a lot of, sorry, excuse me, I'm going to have to plug in my headset, but a lot of people are doing business in the U S dollar, for instance, or some derivative currency that based on the U S dollar. Um, so there's a whole banking system, there's whole standards of accounting. Um, there's infrastructure all over the world of accountants and attorneys, um, to help you figure all that out and establish, um, company membranes with various filings, for corporations and different entities. And, um, all of this has led to centralizations of power on various levels to where at this point on the planet, I think a lot of discussions, I think it's probably happening in circles like yours and in general is, um, there's some downside to that centralization of power that what has ended up happening through, through just agreeing to these standards in the world, agreeing to interact with this standard type of money and these standard ways of incorporating our businesses and, and filing our taxes and all these things, we've actually let ourselves down a road where we're actually, as a, as a general citizen, as a general citizenry, we're disempowered in a lot of ways by uh, what started as a helpful means of standardization became, in a lot of ways, a control system so that some small group gets to dictate how we do business. And of course, um, through their capability within the system has the means to potentially um, strongly suggest or manipulate certain ways of doing business that of course behoove them and their ultimate continued gain of power and, and wealth on the world. And I, you know, so, so there's a lot of really dis interesting discussion happening in various circles. And I think at the core of Holochain and CoGov is, is the desire to provide alternative means of doing business and interacting in ways, bringing forth um, the most authentic, expressions of the individuals to be able to coordinate themselves at scale in ways that can serve the needs of the people uh, at absolutely minimum at the level they're being served now and, and you know, um, theoretically enhance the basic needs of people being met on the planet um, significantly because there's a lot of people going without. And um, I think that's at the core of the philosophy underlying what we're doing with those projects, Holo Chain and Koga. And so uh, agent centricity is something you brought up and yeah, and the social, the social implications of that are critical because what that says is ultimately, and this, this is this, again, this is something that's discussed and perhaps heatedly debated. So, but um, it does essentially represent that the individual sovereignty is the primary measure by which we judge how we're doing in community. Right? And do, do the individuals have access to, to freedom and sovereignty to really follow their own path and, um, and notice the ways that in community we, we share common needs and wants and desires and goals and, and to voluntarily come together when that sharing is present and to be able to not when it's not and, and to recognize that that's paramount. And so if that is assumed to be um, a truth and that, in fact, um, community does exist much stronger, uh, a deep sense of community, a deep sense of the ability to work together and the desire to work together and to build things as a community and, and together um, is enhanced when that underlying individual sovereignty is present. So that's the theory and I think that's what, um, that's what we all stand on in, in this development work. So agent centricity at the protocol level is what Holochain provides. So let's, let's pause right there because I think that there's a distinct, um, something to understand here. Uh, and even bef before we get to like holo chain versus blockchain or things like that, there's a distinction between a centralized technology and a decentralized technology. And like, for example, if we're on Facebook and we're constructing our pers our media persona, right, on, on, on a platform like that. But play Facebook just being one example all of that data that constitutes who we are represented to be in that virtual space is ultimately controlled, ultimately controlled by that central player. So what we see in our newsfeed, what we're allowed to, to share, uh, the, the, the subtle dynamics of the interactions, right, which are very complex, are controlled by that centralized system. The, 
a decentralized system like Holochain works differently how? Yeah, yeah, great point. So that yet yeah, this is another like Facebook is another great example of centralization of power and control and ultimately data, right? And so yeah, what what Holochain does is if you were going to have a social network in Holochain, um, it would look it would it would ultimately function largely the same for the user experience, right? But it give a lot more flexibility. And but what's happening underlying is that when you communicate with the interface, you're actually communicating with your own device. And what's happening through the magic of Holochain is that changes you make to the shared data structure of what you're, you know, what you're trying to share with the world, things on your timeline, your pictures, your profile, things that you want to be shared with the world are then um, gossiped between nodes. And so there is no one central store of data. Each time you're accessing the interface, you're actually accessing your own device that has its own version of the data. And as you make data changes, it shares those changes out within the, what's called the distributed hash table, um, which takes from some of the technology that's inherent in um, BitTorrent or peer-to-peer -peer file sharing. So it's well-tested technology that has proved to be unstoppable and uncontainable and unenclosable, and thus ultimately empowering each individual to have control over their data so it becomes an agent-centric environment. Okay, so, uh, so I mean, that, that gets, I think, to, to some of the technical side of it. Uh, okay. One way that I've thought about this is um, this is going to kind of sound out there, and you know, probably have no space. You know, you know, there's no place for it in the in the technical discussion. But um, in terms of soul, in terms of like what you're, who you are as a person, like if 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 technology, if our virtual selves uh, are actually our an, an externalization of our soul. It's the difference between having control over your own soul, in a sense, right? Mm -hmm. Versus your soul being colonized and owned by all these other, other entities who control how that soul gets to enact itself in the world. It was, so, I like that. Okay, so, so mm -hmm. I mean, what I see in the holochain is that each so-called agent, that's a t another technical word, that's another word for a person. Right. Although there could be agents technically who are not human people. Right. That's right. Right. Or one person could have multiple agencies. Yeah. OK. Um, but the idea is that each agent ultimately has their they have autonomy over their own soul. But there is still network level in the holo chain kind of architecture ways of coordinating those agents in order to get things done that they wouldn't be able to just by themselves. Because that's the, that's the benefit of centralization, right? You right. can get a small group of people together with a whole bunch of money and a whole bunch of technical expertise, and they could build a platform that serves millions or billions of people. Uh, and, and they're able to do that now, you know, relatively efficiently, relatively cheaply compared to, you know, in the past, right? So that's what technology has, has allowed. But the downside of it is then you have that small group of people owning and controlling the means by which all these other people are even able to in interact with one another. Yeah. So how do we shift the power dynamics so that you know, the, the participants in the system have a, an, actu an actual influence and actual uh, appropriate level of control over the environment in which they're um, able to you know, do business together or interact with one another or organize uh, with right. them. Again, so yeah, I'll answer. It might be technical and I appreciate your help in, you know, translating them to a less technical sense. That's great. Um, and I'll try to do my best to do the same. But yeah, again, so um, the interface that you're actually experiencing, when you use software, right, like you pointed out, the goal is to coordinate in some way multiple people together and to create an efficient means of that coordination as opposed to like writing letters to each other and sending them in the mail, carbon copy to 15 different locations. We've been to use digital technology and software to really enable and the internet, of course, to enable that coordination to happen much more efficiently. And it's led to that centralization of power so that you're always relying on somebody to be the center coordinator for all that data coming in. Some, some database administrator has access to all of that data and can manipulate it at their will. Um, so, Again, Holochain flips that on its head because each device, each piece of hardware 
that's, that's interfacing with, with the software side to coordinate actually serves up its own interface. So the entire interface, all the application, uh, all the pieces of digital code that make up that application, both backend business logic and the front end look and feel are stored on your local device. All of the data that's critical, that's been coordinated and aligned in such a way that makes sense and means something to our real lives, right, that, that can feel important in various ways, is also stored on your local device. So you have complete control to disconnect yourself from that system at any time. You have complete control to change that code at any time, change the interface, to change the data, at least to suggest data changes that will be then validated by every other node in the network, see if they agree with that data change. Right, but it empowers you as an individual to do all that. Mm -hmm. So it fundamentally flips that whole thing on its head. No, no more do you wake up one day and Facebook has changed the whole interface that you used to be able to do things a certain way. Now it's completely different. Um, that mm -hmm. that possibility of that even happening is now gone. So, um, I mean, what what else should we understand about Kogov? Uh, like just at a basic level. Yeah. So Kogov essentially um, takes the best of that world, that agent centricity, that um, that local storage and control over your software and interfaces, and says, how do we apply that to the human layer, and how we actually get along and govern each other in the world? If we apply some of those same principles, but yet recognize the complexity, the much greater complexity of human relations and what that entails, we can enter into a greater discussion. So. Um, Kogov just simply proposes how we take those same principles and apply it to human interaction rather than just node interaction, digital nodes um, performing their conversations um, largely in an automated way. You know, but that's that those things are triggered based on a conscious being having an interaction with the software and hardware. So and the, what, the, what do those conscious beings do with each other and how do they interact is a much more complicated environment that a Kogov attempts to address. Hmm. So, so a couple of ways I've like I've imagined this, and um, maybe this these could be like starting points for you know discussion. Are you know we're we're uh, we're we're all artists, writers, you know, intellectuals of various kinds. Um, we're transdisciplinary people doing different, coming with different expertises and different experiences, and working on. You know, starting to work on their own projects, where you know, I can imagine that there are many, many small projects going on in a larger space, and that those projects are and the people that are participating in them are able to use shared resources, platform level resources, storage, media production uh, kind of resources, like this here. We're we're talking on a Zoom chat. It's producing a recording. The recording is going to be published on our forum, it's going to go on YouTube. Uh, and if we had a platform that can coordinate those various activities, and that was un unlike the Facebooks and, you know, other centralized platforms in the world, were at the architectural level and at the governance level, organized around maximizing the individual, you know, individual liberty and freedom and creativity, for the best possible overall result, if that was kind of how we tweaked the the algorithms, then that could be pretty powerful because this is something I think people naturally want to do. They want to mm -hmm. they want to communicate with one another. They want to collaborate with one another. They want they want to create something that's greater than than themselves, and they also want to you know be um, served by that by that process and, and those systems. Like they want to find individual Absolutely. fulfillment. Um, and that's what I want. That's the kind of world I, I want to, to live in. And, I, you know, as we've discussed in other cafes, we want to move towards a different kind of civilization than the kind that we seem to be moving towards uh, in the current trajectory. So, you know, we have this leverage point of technology and of social organization that we could use to try something different, mm -hmm. try something different than the way things are currently being done. And moreover, to create a space where we're not presupposing the answers. Uh, we're exactly. presupposing some ground conditions, some um, parameters, right? But then allowing the intelligence of the people who participate in the system to generate better answers than we could possibly 
you know, indiv- we could possibly do individually, or if we were stuck in our old, old ways and in our old paradigms. So, mm-hmm. um, I'm excited about, you know, the potential for collaboration and for like thinking these things through and like actually designing things that work for the kind of thing that we're already doing. Um, but I don't know how that all looks. And yeah. as I mentioned, we've had many different kinds of conversations in, in different small groups. And so like Jeffrey, Doug, John, you know, they, they weren't at the hackathon. They, they may not have even been, you know, been interested in the hackathon. Um, so how, you know, what, what are the connection points between there? What are the questions that they might have? And, you know, this will get posted on the forum so others could, could watch it and could respond with their own uh, questions or feedback or, 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 you know, whatever they, they have. I mean, that part of this is to, like, this is part of our inquiry, really, and to right. how, how, we, how we govern ourselves. Yeah, yeah. So, wow, it's such, such an eloquent speaker. It's such a great, actually, you're, you're representing very much exactly what the intentions of CoGov are. So, um, thank you. And, um, yeah, so a couple of points there in one sense of um, very much each individual feeling empowered to discover what their passion is and how to contribute that and be able to be able to um, invest in their energy into the things that they're passionate about in a way that through inherent social coordination is, is appreciated by their community, greater community, right? Koga very much sets out with the goal to have that exist. Um, it very much sets out with the goal Another thing you mentioned to um, allow um, an organic field of exploration and what the best means of doing that are without saying that it has the answers, right? So, but what it does do is give us a standard metric by which we can look at all the different deviations of how to um, accomplish governance and spin up organizations and for, in which people are finding their passion and doing the things they love and look at what's working and what's not, and being able to replicate what's working and allow um, what's not to dissipate. So, so by having the standards in place, a browsable ecosystem of organizations, we get to have that data. We get to have that. that get to go to that next level of abstraction, which I actually tend to consider actually a higher level of consciousness. Right? Like, like to me, like the high level of consciousness is not some. Uh, woo woo spiritual term. It's actually just simply the ability to have a greater and deeper understanding of the patterns that you're involved in, in a social sense or in any sense, really, right? But especially in a social sense. So your consciousness, your, your greater consciousness, your understanding of what's happening, the patterns that are happening in the system allow you to make smarter decisions. And if your intention is to create a goodness and a freedom and, a, and, and that environment that we discussed for everybody to pursue their passions, et cetera. You can use that consciousness and that access to that data for us all to create that together. And so that's, that's really some of the fundamental goals. And, um, so, um, I guess, I guess I've just tended to start explaining more technical aspects of how that looks, but we don't have to either. Well, why don't we open it up, uh, for, for um, feedback, comments, questions, thoughts, ideas. Um, and, uh, you know, th- there's plenty of technical stuff in, in the paper about different mm-hmm. styles, different ways that, the, you know, different application potentials, let's say, for, for the framework. Uh, and we could get into those as well. But um, th- I think whatever's on, on, uh, on everyone's mind, uh, let's bring that up. So yeah, for sure. And I'll just state, uh, I, I'm, look, I'm glad to do that now. And I just want to state one other thing that um, the goal of what I proposed in the paper is to have boiled things down to their base standards so that it is complete freedom to operate within. So that every idea of governance and every means of accomplishing coordination can happen in its most organic way. And yet it still is facilitated for on the underlying layer of code. And so if I, so, so one of the things I love to discover is if I've missed anything there, like this is the time to discover that. Cool. All right. Uh, so I, I, I'm still, so you say it's not an app. I get that. But 
um, it's not exactly just a set of principles either. It's a kind of, so I'm still trying to struggle with understanding what exactly we're talking about here. Is it a set? Is it a suite of development tools that's coming or, you know, this kind of question, I guess I have. Sure. So um, it is technically called a mix-in and in, in Holochain, a mix-in is essentially a library. So it's a standard library that a developer can use, bring into their application and, and know that they're doing accessing this layer in a way that other applications are also accessing the same layer. So you have this standard of coordination across applications. Um, what it actually boils down to is in, in Holochain, there are your zones that they call, uh, which is um, basically a record description. Okay, it's a, it's a schema description of, of when you store a piece of data in a database, what, the, what is that data? What does it mean? And how do we know when you want to store that record in our shared data store called the DHT that it's valid? So um, what, what Holochain largely is about is defining those record, those records and how they're made up, what, what, um, what they're made up of, what data is important to that record and the validations of that data. So then what's uh, added or changed in the shared data store, we can know that that was a valid change. Um, so CoGov proposes a set of those things, a set of zones and validations for those zones. So things like, um, like one of the things that's proposed is no matter what means of group governance you have, at some point, somebody makes something that looks just like a proposal. Hey, we should do this. And almost inevitably, there's some kind of discussion that occurs and some iteration on that proposal. And at some point, there's a, an agreement to move forward uh, under that proposal or not. And so those key events are all laid out as record and as zones means that you would store those types of events and the outcomes of any decisions or discussions around those events and the validation that let us know that that was in fact true and valid according to all the um, the stakeholders in that collective does that okay. make sense jeffrey yeah yeah it's fine um so it, essentially, one would have to have one's own application running on Holochain in order to use your set of, of libraries in relation to it. That's definitely correct at this stage. Yep. Okay. There's totally the possibility that we could agree on these standards in a wider spectrum, um, but I think, you know, I guess. There's this point at which I consider you've drank the whole chain Kool-Aid. And what it means is that you've understood um, the critical nature of the openness of the application development environment that Holochain has brought forth. So, um, and, and from within which you have complete freedom to explore and build anything you want. And so we're at the point where you, you, you ultimately reach log the logical conclusion that most people reach once they've you know, kind of drank this Kool-Aid is that why would you want to do it any other way? And so that's kind of where I'm sitting. And, you know, it's not to say that we're, that, that I'm closed off or that we should be closed off to interoperability with things outside of Holochain at all. But, but it just does kind of really feel that once you, once you truly take in what Holochain is doing, that it really is a great means of building every type of application. So our social net Facebook should repla be replaced with a distributed application built on Holochain or, or distributed application, certainly. And, and Holochain being the only distributed application development environment I really am fully aware of that, that follows these, these principles of agent centricity. Um, everything we use, all the critical apps, the Twitters and the, and the Airbnbs and the, um, and, and the Ubers, like we, we don't need, especially, uh, with the Airbnb and Uber, we don't really need a company to be in the middle of that transaction. We need a piece of, we need a piece of shared software to be in the middle of that transaction. Mm -hmm. When you want a ride um, and somebody wants to give a ride, you can align. We don't necessarily need a company in the middle 
to take a, to, to take a piece of a financial exchange to make that happen. Um, that's one of many examples. So that's the ultimate vision of what can be accomplished ultimately. Doug, you have a question? I have two questions. Uh, a, a quick comment that I, I'm a, a taste tester, I suppose. So I haven't fully had the, the Kool-Aid experience because um, I'm still trying to wrap my head around the technological part. But my questions are, I guess, going off what we're talking right about right now um, and something that Marco and maybe Caroline introduced to me called Sandstorm. So maybe you can talk a little bit more about that, Marco. I don't know if you've heard of it, Raymond, but that's where uh, Rocket Chat and there are many different um, applications on there that are decentralized, that are made by humans um, and have um, the intention to be linked with um, something like Holochain, I believe. But maybe you could expand on that, Marco. Or And is this something that um, the CoGov is hoping to do, or is that, it seems like there's a different layer and CoGov would be kind of the underlying foundation and that, that step would be the sandstorm um, would be something else. And I'll save my other question later. Well, I could, I could, uh, I could give, uh, I can say what sandstorm, sandstorm is. It's, it's a, it's basically a, um, a site that lets you um, launch open source applications. So it has a collection of open source applications, meaning that anybody could use them, adapt them, change them. The, the code itself is not proprietary. It's not owned by a given company. Uh, and then Sandstorm is just a collection of them. So Rocket Chat is one example. It's a chat application. Um, there are text editors. There are, you know, tweet, uh, Twitter clones, various kinds of applications. And it just lets you easily launch them so that you don't have to know how to install each any individual application uh, on your server. I think Kogov potentially might look something like that where the applications are uh, particular kinds of governance, particular means of decision making like holacracy or sociocracy or like that would be one of the options, like launch a sociocracy app or something like that, and then you can have your organization, you know, use that app to make whatever decision decisions. Um, but I think the open source part is I mean, that's all, also a basic aspect. It's not owned by any one given entity, uh, and there's a, just a principle around that. I think which it's not to say that good technology can't be, you know, proprietary because there's a lot of good proprietary technology, but that in the situation that we're in globally, where ownership um, and concentration of wealth is so becoming so extreme. And is when, it, when that's part of the problem, part of my desire has been to move towards, uh, means of interaction that don't depend upon those particular kinds of ownership where ownership becomes returned to, you know, us, the users of the technology. So Sandstorm mm -hmm. would be an example of that. Holy yeah. Trinity would be another. Cool. Yeah. I'd love to speak to Sandstorm. Um, would it be okay if I share my screen for a second? Sure. Can you guys see that? Mm hmm all right, so what it looks like uh, on a brief read of Sandstorm is that they are promoting, like you said, uh, Marco, this open source um, means of easily self-hosting open source applications. So um, in other words, um, I can't think of the name of it, but there is a, there is a social network standard that is, um, operates in this mean where anybody can pop up their own server to host this this uh, uh, social network platform, but yet they are still coordinating somehow. And so this is an example of decentralized technology as opposed to centralized technology like Facebook. So you can see there what centralized technology looks like on the left, where there's one central server or set of servers 
all and every node, every user talks to that one central set. But it looks like things like Sandstorm are doing is they're allowing a bunch of different people to host versions of the app. Whether they're coordinated or not is a big, huge question, right? But then assuming that there is some level of coordination between the varying um, installations and hosting, self-hosting of the instance of the application, um, you get a decentralized structure. And on the right, you get what Holochain is proposing, is, which is distributed structures. So um, just kind of one of the neat analogies to make is like what looks the strongest and most stable of those three structures. And um, generally, clearly, the distributed net on the right looks the strongest. Looks like it can um, be the most stable. So that's the idea, is that um, there isn't even a difference anymore between being a client and a server. There isn't an idea of self-hosting because every single node is its own host. Every single node is hosting the application and the application's data. I hope that answered that question. Yeah, thanks. That's yep. helpful. Hmm. Yeah, I stopped sharing now. So no one else has any other questions. I had another question that arose from this, and I'm thinking of the, the Cosmos Collective or the Infinite Conversations. There's there's three or four tiers, so somebody that just joined will not have access to somebody that's been on there for three or four years. Um, Same with maybe a, a Quaker group or something like that. There's everybody that's a part of the community, but there's also those that are within certain groups. So there's more of a decentralization, I suppose, um, with that. Um, I, maybe that sounds like this currency. Maybe the question of like multi. I'm sorry, go ahead, good, Raymond. But I mean, you're kind of oh, talking, I, talking about influence and like social currency in a way right mm -hmm. and i guess that's what i was kind of getting at is how does how does that tie in with what the the paper's talking about with yeah the influence i can't remember the exact term i don't have it in front of me right now but those with more influence uh, for lack of better. yeah <clears throat> okay so yeah there's a bunch of topics there there's influence currency and in which which is kind of a weight in decision making there's, it sounds like there's a membrane question there. Like how does one get access to a membrane? One, how does one even uh, get identified as someone who has a voice in a particular discussion? And those are handled in CoGov by collectives and councils within collectives. And um, there's also kind of feels like it might be, you're drifting into like the transparency privacy topic. Like is there, you know, do these new users even get to know about the discussions that are happening and things in these other circles of the more uh, veteran users. So I could talk about any and all of that if there's any particular thing that sounded more interesting. Uh, yeah, uh, I guess any and all, but uh, more specifically, I'm personally interested in how, or even the philosophy behind where this came from. Was it, it, it sounds like there's even Native American influence um, I'm familiar with Quaker. Jeffrey's familiar with Quaker groups. So there's a lot of similarities there. I, I was wondering kind of the origins of these ideas and taking that into maybe the more technical yeah. side of things. The origins of the ideas, I guess, I think I kind of co covered that in that <clears throat> it largely hinges on that, again, that recognition that in individual sovereignty is paramount and that group coordination and community creation is all enhanced when individual sovereignty is felt and known. Um, so in that, we look to create structures that um, that always represent that, and that any time you're verging away from complete individual sovereignty and freedom, it's a, <clears throat> it's a voluntary decision you're making, and that voluntary decision is probably recorded somewhere for everybody to see. Um, see your commitment to that. And um, so, um, you know, ultimately the next, one of the next thoughts is, you know, it's pretty hard to have a discussion or make decisions in one group of all seven and a half billion people on the planet. That wouldn't, you know, probably be fruitful. 
um, to have everybody's voice be heard and such. So, so there is this necessary um, need to have membranes, like different layers and levels of, of grouping of where discussions happen, where decisions get made. Um, and that naturally leads to um, a discussion of who has say in these very circles. So once you identified membrane, um, part of the, part of the critical thing about membranes is is um, decision making is generally pretty easy and, and flowing. Like if the five of us just wanted to decide, hey, we're we already agreed we're going to a movie. We just want to decide which movie we're going to go see, right? Like. Nobody's, nobody's livelihood is at stake, you know, and, and, and so it can be an easygoing discussion. We ultimately, uh, there might be some disagreement at first, but then we all agree and, and go see a movie together. Um, that can be totally different if we're all, the five of us are overseeing a fund of a million dollars and um, we all decide how to spend it together. That discussion can get intensely more heated, potentially, at least it, in my experience, it certainly has the potential to be that. Um, so, so as assets are involved in the discussion, these membranes become more and more important. Again, like if the five of us are gonna go see a movie and hey, oh, hey, Fred wants to join us too and, and Caroline wants to join us too, no problem. Yeah, come on along, easy. All of a sudden, Fred and Caroline wanna just join the discussion and have a say in how we spend a million dollars, maybe not such an easy decision. So, um, so, so membranes generally, in my experience, seem to be about assets and management, stewarding of assets. Um, and the idea of getting away from ownership and into stewarding. So we recognize that really everything, the one, the inherent oneness of all things, the inherent sharing of our resources on the planet, and that any, any particular piece of those resources that we seem to have a greater say or, or control over is only our stewardship over that for a temporary time. And so, yeah, there's some Native American influence there, right? Um, and um, so, so anyway, determining who has stewardship over what assets is what the membranes of councils and, and collectives essentially allow you to do, we say. Um, and then and then a further breakdown of that can be said that any particular asset that a particular council or collective oversees can actually be broken down into um, uh, a currency that identifies individuals who actually have a greater ownership slash stewardship in a particular asset. Um, and another, so that's, that's called an equity currency and you actually, it actually re represents a ownership slash stewardship in a particular asset. Um, and influence currency is another, um, idea represented in the paper that is about, um, decision-making authority essentially over any particular topic or assets is a lot of times what it boils down to. Does anybody have more say than anybody else? Or is it a completely uh, one voice, one vote kind of system? All of that is possible um, by the holding of influence currency. So some people can hold more, and other, or you could have a system where everybody's holding equal amounts. Um, and it, so another philosophical point made throughout the paper is that while ultimately decisions do come down to a resolution, Right, which ultimately comes down to contributing your voice to that resolution in the form of something called a vote. Like there's no way around it. There's something called a vote that kind of does happen at some point. Right. Um, your, your, your individual proposal, how to resolve something, um, resolve the discussion or, or an idea. Um, but that it encourages the, the idea that if we can never have things come down to a vote, we're probably doing better as a community. That if there's discussion happening and proposals made and we kind of it's in the magic is happening in the iteration of that proposal so that by the time we even finalize the proposal and we even really agree on what we're even talking about and what we might do there's already kind of like a consensus created and at that point it's just a formality to go ahead and say yeah we all agree let's do this or perhaps it's a formality to say well most of us agreed there was a dissenting voice we'd like to make sure that 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 process that process has been recorded by the co-glove layer and, and perhaps that dissenting voice is also going to have a uh, recording as well so that so you have all of that decided uh, and, and and recorded ah i could go on and on but I'll, I'll that's that's that. very helpful and um, yeah i do like the idea of councils of 10 so it doesn't get too expansive there and um, so I, I really enjoyed that section and it made a lot of sense so. I'll, I'll work on my technical jargon there. <laughs> right. 
Yeah, that's been an important number. Um, 10 to 12, I've heard that over and over. And I particularly reference the work of community planet and discovering that number um, just through real life work with groups of people. And when does it, when does it get really difficult, even with a great facilitator present, when does it get really difficult to manage moving things forward? And that's been the wisdom that's come forth. You know, one, you. one example that I, where I could imagine these kinds of uh, the technology layer being, being helpful would be a particular project like a book. Jeffrey, for example, is writing a, a series of novels and he's the author. So he's a principal equity stakeholder, let's say, like in that, in that project, uh, owner uh, if, uh, of that project. But he's not alone in it. He has editors working with him, book designers, marketers, etc. And in a traditional publish, publishing situation, you know, he would submit that book to a, a publisher and then uh, they would work out a contract and the publisher would take on certain rights and he would retain certain other rights, but they would be fronting the money and they would be you know, ideally taking charge of the promotion and, and so forth. And he would participate in this whole schema and this this whole set of rules that were that were set out but we're not doing it that way because jeffrey as a co-op member is also an owner he's also the publisher uh he is a co-publisher he's a co-owner not only of the, the the text of his creative work but also of the means of production and the means of distribution of that text along with others so we could imagine a collective that is dedicated to Jeffrey's work, where um, each person who contributes to that project is um, recognized uh, by the record of um, contributions and the the life cycle of what whatever that work is going to do in the world. It may be sold, it may be turned into a movie. Who who knows what may what may come of it? But somehow the the sort of um, we could, some would call it a smart contract, but I think it's more than that because it it really would bring together the intelligence of the group into creating the best possible the best possible um, work of art, and then also uh, uh, guide how that group would be you know would continue to to benefit uh, from the success of of the work, and that could all be sort of provided by or like the, the framework for that that the could be provided by the, the technical layer as long as we have the human understanding of of what of what it means to be working together in that way because it's a very different right. kind of way of doing things than the traditional model um right and, and then i, I think that it's, okay. well just just to say i mean that could scale to other levels of the organization like a whole journal involves a lot of different people and there's a different kind of way that we would configure that but we'd be able to really like recognize everybody who's really participating appropriately. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And that's, and so the, the, you're, in that discussion, there is inherent the differentiation of equity currency. So these are categories of currency, right? And each application, each instance uh, of an application built on CoGov can define particular currencies. These are categories of currencies, one being equity currency. So you could say, that there's um, an equity currency based on the intellectual property ownership of a particular work. You could then say, in you know, part of the discussion, and in, in when you have a, an intellectual property, a work is um, how how do we as a collective best share that work with the world, right? So obviously there can be a lot of effort that goes into that part as well, and so. In that, there's going to be a discussion that clarity created around clearly logged agreements, right? Uh, and logged in the form of currency flow as to does your contribution to the sharing of that work get you equity in the work itself? Or is that, does that represent something different? Does that represent, um, does that represent uh, an equity in uh, a sales number, an ultimate value flow is determined, you know, I'll just I'll bring some 3D current world terms back in. If we're selling things for dollars for money, sales like does does your contribution represent a certain um, 
percentage of that only, but doesn't actually give you equity in the work itself. Like those kind of things can all be determined. And, and that type of currency um, falls under what I'm calling fiat. And I'm not stuck. I'm not sure I like that name ultimately, but fiat is kind of like catch all currency category for any type of value flow, any type of metric that you want to have get tracked um, that, that doesn't fall into any of the other categories. And so um, contributions to the sharing of work, in other words, could be one of those. So you're recognizing whether it's the time contributions or just uh, uh, an, an amount of currency that will flow based on uh, the completion of an accountability towards that end. All of those things are possible. And then, of course, ultimately, the influence currency over the work does the original creator maintain, you know, these are the questions you get to ask and get have represented by metrics within the system by looking at the currency flow. Does the original creator in that work maintain 100% of the influence currency over what happens with that work? Right. And it doesn't necessarily have to be exactly congruent with equity ownership either. So you can have greater influence currency, but share more equity ownership or vice versa. I have a quite a practical well, I don't it's not maybe it's not maybe you're not the right person to ask it, but I'm gonna ask it anyway. <laughs> so um I tried to load a hollow chain onto my computer, but it requires a fair amount of Unix savvy in order to do that. I have a Mac and Unix is integral to the Mac, but the Unix savviness that I need to do that is not in me and I, I can't find the right resources to do it. Do you have any suggestions on how, I mean, it would be nice to get it up and running and, and try some of these things, you know, try some yeah. early experimentations with it. Yeah, I would I would actually be you're asking the right person for sure. Uh, although I can say that um, I, I was on the core development team with Holochain for about seven months. Um, primarily in the first few months, I was actually working on core development, getting the alpha release out and working on some of the initial sample apps. Uh, ultimately moved into kind of more of touring around doing sharing uh, through the hackathon tour in Europe I did. And then uh, ultimately just leaving that memory all together so I could focus on what my core passion was, which is building this layer on top of Holochain. So that being said, it's been three or four months since I've been in the core development circles to really be totally on top of the latest releases. But I will tell you, you know, share that it's in alpha right now. So you're definitely going to expect, you know, a little bit of a bumpy road. Um, when, you, when you go to install, you never know quite the exact status or whether the latest build uh, might have a little bit of buggy thing going on. It's really not something they're sharing with the world. It's definitely for the brave explorers who wish to join at this stage. And I would definitely uh, extend the offer that if you uh, are committed to doing that and you want help, let's, let's set up a time and let's do some screen sharing and we'll make sure we Hello. figure it out for you. It's probably, as I said, it's probably pretty basic. It's just uh, navigating the directory structure and, uh, and things like that, you know, to some extent. Yeah. Because you have to do that and, and setting up you know, pipes or whatever, and these kinds of things in order for the, for it to work, you know, pass and stuff like that. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've gone through the installation with people a couple dozen times and it, and it is evolving, of course, with each incremental release. So again, yeah, if you, if you, if you're committed to that, reach out to me and let's, time I've what's yeah, that? It's not the first time I've been through the alpha or beta versions of software. So, you know, I understand yeah. the, the uh, caveats on the problem. <laughs> yeah, for sure. But, we're, but you know, uh, you know, we're honored as as the whole Jane team to have people take make the choice to to be an explorer. So let me know if you want to help with that. Okay, thank you. John, do you do you have any questions? I, I'm not sure that I have a direct question. Um, I don't know if this is helpful at all. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but I've been enjoying the conversation, and I came here mostly because um, I wanted to learn something, and I and I'm beginning to. And maybe then I can uh, reread the paper. Um, with, you know, the ex explanations that have been offered and the conversations that have been had here. Um, 
uh, I really appreciate uh, that uh, you mentioned, uh, Raymond, uh, a higher level of consciousness is a deeper understanding of patterns. And in, in one paragraph, you mentioned um, every living being governs each other with every interaction that they have. And then later in that paragraph, I'm sure I'm sorry I don't have a whole paragraph. I didn't write it down. You do mention that there's uh, perhaps uh, you can become more influential in decisions that affect others in those areas. So I'm interested in this: the difference and what determines governance from influence. Um, and this is just my private sort of angst around these issues because mm. I want to have influence, but I don't necessarily want a thumbs up or thumbs down vote. There are some things that I could appreciate why you want an upper thumbs down vote if it's you know for a congressman or representative or you're in a that kind of traditional institutional setting or your shareholder or whatever. But I think, I think the challenge for, for myself and the complex systems that, I'm, that are influencing me and maybe that I could influence even in small ways, um, I, I, I'm attracted to the, that distributed network, in the centralized, the decentralized, and the distributed. And, and you mentioned that that was more stable, the, the, um, the distributed. And that is, that's sort of what kind of worries me, is coming up with something that's the most stable. Um, mm. I know, I'm just throwing these out there. I don't, ex hopefully to stimulate some sort of, um, because I, I'll, I'll tell you a little story. I had a friend, a, a very close friend. This was before the internet days. I think things have changed considerably since then. But she had a, she passed out. They put her in a, you know, she went to an emergency room. They took x-rays. They, they said she had a big blank brain tumor. And, um, you know, she was, they showed her the brain tumor on, a, on an x-ray. And there was the, and the doctor, uh, he said he was going to do the surgery. At that, you know, they were going to do that right in like the next 10 minutes. <laughs> and she, um, she just noted that, the, that this brain surgeon he looked like, she's, he, she said he looked like he was in high school. He was just a kid. Um, and that uh, as they were wheeling her to the surgery room, her companion who was with her, she says, I hope this guy read the chapter. And those were the last words she said before she went to the surgery. Um, fortunately, the surgery was successful and she did have a, a dramatic recovery and um, it was a very transformative, ultimately, experience for her, um, I'm glad to say. But I think maybe we live in a world where, and no one asked her what her opinion was. And she realized that she was not the right person for anyone to make, you wouldn't ask her uh, to, it would be irresponsible if they had asked her what her opinion was on this. She thought maybe, I guess she could have objected vociferously and they may not have done the surgery. Um, so I think we're in those kinds of complex situations um, are rare, fortunately, for most of us. But now, you know, you know if she had her uh, device with her, she might start looking at, you know, uh, uh, for another expert in, uh, opinion on this. Um, but I think that's the nature of these distributed networks, if they get too stable. Um, how are we going to deal with the with the uh, the turbulence and the occasional impasse, conflict, um, dilemma? When each of these conflicts, dilemmas, impasses have a different texture to them and a different kind of intensity, and some of them are very mild and uh, don't need a lot of attention, but some some of them have enormous intensity. Um, so these are the kind of unfair questions I'm asking myself. Oh, no, no, good stuff. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, just, um, I just don't know. Um, hmm. uh, 
I, I, and, and where another question I have is where business can be conducted um, and using uh, Holochain to conduct business. And I'm just curious about what kind of business. Um, okay. Because I don't know that at Cosmos right now, I don't know what our business exactly is. Uh, okay. If it's about transactions, um, money flows and things like that. Uh, I believe a lot of the work we're doing here is volunteer and it's imaginal and it's, um, it can be extremely intense. And I don't know, it needs a thumbs up, thumb, thumb down, thumb up vote. Um, but I do think there's a, a lot of influence going in many different directions. And I believe we are here at this uh, cosmos to influence one another. I want to mm -hmm. be influenced because I know I, I'm not an expert in very much. But what yeah. I am an expert in, I also know other people aren't, aren't able to evaluate what I say <laughs> because mm -hmm. they don't have the expertise. Yes. So I'm an expert in some Perhaps. But not much, but I know enough. Yeah. I'm efficient in some areas and can ask some good questions. And right. I, and, and others are going to be experts in areas where I'm not. Right. So I right. hope, to, hope to ask as many useful questions for a, an interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary, our, our transdisciplinary projects like this could start um, taking mm -hmm. off rather, yeah. than, rather than crashing at the laundry pad. <laughs> you know, yeah, right. right. So much yeah. going on that needs to be planned. Yeah. There's a lot that it's not. We're we're really not ready to scale anything up because <clears throat> okay. some things that right. work at a smaller scale just don't scale up at all particularly well. We've seen that yeah. over and over again. Inventions that look right. great, um, but then when you try to scale them up, they crash. So all right, I'm gonna try to jump in because I'm making notes of all the things. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, I got a little so, long-winded there. No, it's great. Thank you. Thank you. It's all great input and, and, and very fascinating discussion. Thank you. Um, and uh, so first, yeah, you know, uh, coordination across disciplines is certainly a stated goal of, of what we can do with COGA. It's in the paper. Um, what I guess I want to respond to primarily when I when I when I say stable, um, and what I and what I think would most accurately represent the benefits of the st kind of stability I'm talking about is that that was an animated um, image. And what you would see is tens of thousands of nodes in the space of which we're maybe have about 20 or 30. Uh, and, not, and, and rather than static lines connecting them all, you would see lines coming and going between various nodes for different reasons. But overall, what you have is just a bit stable holding place, right? But but the connections are moving all the time. There's, it's organically flowing and, and reforming constantly, but yet creating a net stability. Right. Um, that, I think that would most accurately represent what it is. You know, a frac or you make it three dimensional and make it fractalized. You know, you get even more. Um, you know, biomimicry is is core to the design of Holochain, and so. Um, I guess ideally in terms, uh, maybe maybe the statement ought to be in the paper is um, we all, instead of we all govern each other, but we all influence each other. Maybe that's actually I think you know, there's, more. You can do both, but I think they yeah, have yeah. a different feeling to each of those words for me. Right, right. And I guess in a, in a, in a perfect world for sake of discussion and my level of understanding, my level of consciousness um, is some is that influence ought to be determined roughly by the factors of how are you affected by the outcome one way or the other and what expertise from past history of making these kinds of decisions do you have? Some combination of that. And, and, and you definitely one of the principles proposed throughout the paper is that there, we don't have answers. We're not trying to propose answers to questions, right? We're trying to create an environment where we can try different things and get the feedback loop have a feedback loop going between what we try, the results of that, and then what we can try next. That is certainly the goal. So we're constantly iterating, we're constantly evolving our consciousness individually and collectively, getting smarter, having more access to data and information, learning more, making smarter decisions. And, um, and hopefully part of those smarter decisions is how we identify and give influence to others within the system. And a lot of this is very, can't be quantified. A lot of it's very all about qualities and moods and affects and, mm -hmm. 
and that juicy stuff that makes us human, but some of the, that what can be quantified, we need to be, pay attention to how we're quantifying that. That's right. That's the goal. That's it's the just challenge. Yeah. Right. To create a system, a standard system of recording our quantifications, right? right? All kinds of quantifications. We don't even define what they are ahead of time. We're just saying, let's, let's have standard ways of, of identifying quantifications that are meaningful and to us making smart collective decisions. And individual Thank you. Qualities could be captured as well. I mean, like in the case of a dissenting opinion on, on a decision that's made. I mean, the fact that you could trace back the history of that decision and see what the thinking process was, see what the points of agreement and disagreement were, that becomes um, a reference point uh, for future decisions or future deliberations. Like the fact that that is recorded someplace and that you have access through the quantities to the qualities. So you could see what Doug had to say about it or what Jeffrey said, or you could go back to our video and watch the conversation and, and see really what played out. To me, like having that record is a way of establishing pathways for memory. It's a way of establishing pathways for social and cultural memory. Uh, and I mean, what concerns me, one of the things that concerns me about the, the centralized systems is that we have gatekeepers and guardians of, of the memory, you know, of our cultural memory, of what we can remember and what we are guided to forget. Uh, and that, that has a very distorting effect on what we ultimately do with the information that we have. So, you know, there's kind of the bigger planetary question and the civilizational question. I, I don't know how to address those other than looking at our actual actual circumstances and our actual relationships like this is the it seems the, the area where we can start to make a difference is in how we interact with each other and then whether or not we can scale up our particular interactions we could start at least creating models for you know that could be built upon in other in other contexts uh yeah. so for sure it strikes me as super creepy that um the conglomerative advertising tracker systems out there probably know more about my behavior than I recognize about my own behavior. That's a little bit creepy, uh, let alone the fact they know it for everybody. I'd at least like to know that, right? I would like, if we're going to have that information tracked, could I at least have access to my own behavior patterns that I might not be able to see? Um, so. but, but the economic incentives are there for you not to have that, that the same access. I mean, that asymmetry exactly. is, is built in. Yeah. And what I see is the potential of Holochain and I mean it's part of it's part of the ethos of these decentralized and distributed frameworks and apps and this, it's kind of a movement I think is in a way it's just going around the system uh, kind of because you know I, I can't take on Wall Street I can't take on the industrial military complex you know I don't we, we can't do that but we can kind of outsmart them. I think by designing better systems that attract more people to use them because there are going to be better benefits in the end. Um, yeah. And so, it, you know, this is a relatively small and co-ate effort, but I think that by linking up the various initiatives that are going on and by starting to develop these kind of common languages and common um, inter, uh, arc, you know, structures, uh, distributed structures, uh, I think the bet is that we could, move toward the world that we want rather than continue on the, the path that, that we're on. I want to ask one more question, Raymond, before we get to the end of the 90 minutes. Um, it's kind of an idealistic question, but I think it's, you know, with the technical and the kind of the philosophical discussions we've had, I would want to know in, if you were, wi if you were wildly successful, if Kogov was wildly successful, you know, beyond your, your dreams, like what would, or at the limit of your dreams, let's say, since, since you still have to be able to talk about it, uh, what would that look like? What would the world look like uh, if this works? Yeah. So one of the, one of the most exciting things I have in my mind that I don't think is all that far off, um, if, if this is embraced, and it, whether it's co-gov or not, if we do have a standards layer of any kind, right, is this interface that you can open up and have your selections of you know obviously your, your filters on what what kind of 
uh, things you want to see, but where every um, collective um, stewardship over assets is represented as a, as a collective on as a, dot, um, as a node on the screen, very similar to what we were looking at earlier when I shared my screen. Now, all these nodes are connected with how they're how and when they're interacting and um, show to represent their interaction between each other, a value flow going between each other. A browsable network of web that you can browse into, click any one of those nodes, look at um, what that membrane is, what their mission and vision values, what, what are they doing in the world, what are they proposing to do, and then having the ability to go through and look at their Look at their history of governance, looking at who's making decisions, who's having influence and what um, what as uh, through that transparent um, view of the ledger of operations and decisions and proposals and value flows and everything else that's reported in the system. You get a sense for who everybody is and what, what their ultimate um, motivations are and what their patterns of behavior are so that you have greater choice and how and if you want to interact with them in any way. And um, this also allows us to inherently see where, where power and value flow is centralizing. And so really start to get asked more questions about where we see centralizations of, of value flow happening. We get to ask maybe more, look more intensely at those um, and see if it's better to, you know, start moving, moving away from that centralization that's happening there and all those kind of questions. Um, but yeah, having that be a very browsable, um, interactive user experience available to anybody and everybody at any time. It's definitely something I see on the horizon. It's super exciting to me. Like what, uh, uh, so let me see if, I mean, just if I am seeing what you're seeing, like I'm on my, com my phone, I open it up and there's an app, CoGov app maybe. And there are, nodes for all the different communities, all the different contexts in which this is being used. Some things I have access to, other things I don't. Like if it's local government of um, a city in Yugoslavia or something, not Yugoslavia, <laughs> Croatia, um, I wouldn't have access to, to their decisions, but they might be a node in the sort of total map of all the different nodes that have influence and governance over different aspects of, of the world or another... Yeah, you know, one asset might be Cosmos. It might be here's the Cosmos right. node, and this is what it's doing. And here are the ways I, I interface with it. Here's where I have influence. Here's where I have equity or other, you know, access points, um, and I'm able to in interact there. Then I can move into some other context that I have, uh, maybe my local uh, government. <coughs> government. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know those. Those would all be interconnected. I mean, they're not mm -hmm. seen as separate. And that's right. Uh, and you know, I'm able to participate to the degree that I am able and wish to in the ways that uh, energy and um, decision making and um, resources are flowing. Right. Different, different plate. You know, different right. nodes. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And, you know, not to open the can of worms of privacy and transparency with this little few minutes we have left, but ultimately, yeah, uh, my vision is definitely a heavy level of transparency. So that yes, in fact, you could probably find your way into the government of Yugoslavia, some district of Yugoslavia, and see what's happening there if you wanted. Um, and yes, another thing you mentioned that is inherent is there's not really a big differentiation between the things, the collective enterprises uh, we, we recognize as governments versus the ones we recognize as businesses versus the ones we recognize as communities and neighborhood associations, and town councils, and even bridge clubs. Um, all of these things are just, these are people coming together with a shared mission and vision and a shared purpose that they want to share their energy in. And they create a membrane that we call a collective and system that you can call any interface, you can call it anything they want. But yeah, this is totally browsable. And so obviously if you do have access, um, and then Holochain is an inherently a very transparent way of, just like a blockchain solution, it's a very transparent way of having data exist in the world. Um, <clears throat> yeah, there are ways um, to register those so that you can have this browsable interface and, and ways to hide things if you want to be more private. And But yeah, ultimately, a pretty high level of discoverability. Okay, cool, cool. Um, well, um... Doug, Jeffrey, John, any, any, any last questions or thoughts? Well, I, I've really enjoyed uh, our discussion today. It's really opened me up to 
areas I need to study a little more diligently. So I may not be an expert yet, but if I keep, you know, sharing, you know, good feelings and multiple perspectives from others who are more expert, I believe I can move towards something that's a little more efficient than where I'm at. So it's good to know when you're a beginner, <laughs> in other words, and um, to, to take the, you know, to be interested in stuff that you're, uh, you know, very confused about. And this has been a confusing area for me. And yet I know that Marco has been really drawn to Holo Chain and uh, we've had other discussions about this and from people that I really respect um, who, who are drawn to this kind of investigation. So thank you for this opportunity, Raymond. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity and for the great contribution to the discussion. Thank you. I'd also like to thank you for coming in and talking to us. Um, I think this transparency issue is possibly one of the more important things that you've talked about uh, in terms of what Hollow Chain and what Hollow Chain itself and then what uh, Kogav offers. I think this transparency, because obviously it's, you know, people being people will still do rotten things even through Kogav. But if you can at least see who's doing the work, you can you can you can adjust and compensate for it. And, and of course, in the current systems, it's just about impossible to do. So, um, you know, I think transparency may be a very important element to this kind of thing. Yep, it really is the starting point for Hologene that it's pretty transparent, and you have to actually do a lot of work to be untransparent. And for the follow-up on the practical side, I'll get your email from Marco and we'll coordinate if you're okay. Great. I look forward to that, Jack. Oh, cool. all right. Well, um, uh, I'd love to see you while, when, when you're in Boulder. Let's uh, have a cup of coffee or something. You're going to be around. For sure. Yeah, man. Uh, look forward to that. Yeah, I really appreciate you joining us for this. Uh, it was, it was, it's cool. And... Um, uh, it's challenging, I think, but but I'm I think it's it, it's going to be really powerful to be able to translate between very distinct narratives and discourses. You know, like we're a lot of times talking about consciousness and cosmology and uh, very kind of out there stuff, weird phenomena, stuff like that. But I don't think it's fundamentally like um, out of bounds from what what people who are much more into the technology side are doing. I, I think, yeah. I think we're like working on different sides of the elephant or different sides of the, you know, the same phenomenon. We're trying to find our way to um, that e ecological civilization that, that, um, or, you know, that just more beautiful future. Uh, and uh, so if I feel like if we could join forces or, you know, coordinate our distributed nodes in, you know, in, beautiful ways that we're going to be a lot more effective overall. Uh, so I'm yeah. glad to have this feels, conversation. Yeah, it feels uh, very much like uh, forces joined um, for sure. And um, definitely with the underlying goal of, of, of raising collective consciousness on the planet being just simply providing access to information to be able to identify the patterns collectively and individually. And so all those topics you mentioned, yeah, are part of the information that have a play into the patterns of our, our ability to understand the patterns. No matter how esoteric or, or out there it might be, if there's any truth to it, it can affect the patterns that we're experiencing on this planet. And having some people talking about that and bringing it forth into the collective discussion is critical. So, cool. Yeah, well, that I'm, I'm glad that you, you all are open to it because um, it's, it's just going to get weirder. <laughs> thank you so much marco for i really appreciate your take on all this and as well as everybody on the call very um intriguing and enlightening discussion yeah thank you ray take care bye guys thank, thank you all see you next time